I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, any, I, we've asked Kinley to pray, or Kinley Volenpold, um to pray today. Um, is there, so I know she's pre-planned that, and that was the purpose of asking people ahead of time, but are there any prayer requests that we can all put on our mind and hearts, and, and if she's able, she can add it? Yes. Okay. All right. Randy's shoulder replacement surgery on Tuesday. Anything else? Randy, yes. All right. I'm going to let Kinley start us, and then I have a little announcement to make, and then we will get started. That's totally fine. Amen. Thank you. Um, so real quickly, um, we have just, well, we were counting. We're over the halfway point in this um, class, and we had a date. It is May 21st. It is Sunday, May 21st, that um, no one had ever, you know, we didn't have enough, I shouldn't say enough, we didn't have anyone volunteer that they'd like to speak on that day. Um, Christy and I, the following week will be kind of like a review sum up week. And we now, or we for sure know what we want to do that week. Um, so here's what I'm saying. On May 21st, Sunday, May 21st, maybe you have something after hearing what people have shared. Um, maybe you want to share something, but maybe that 30, 35 minutes sounds intimidating, um, but you have some things you would like to share. Talk to Christy or I about that, please. Um, we're trying to just, if we get enough people who maybe just say, I need just 10 minutes, I have something I think would be important. Um, if we have enough of those, then we've got the class filled. Otherwise, we do have another plan, um, and we can make that work. But it's been so enjoyable. We've learned so much from all the ladies who have already spoken. Um, and so if that is you and you might, you know, want to fill in in that way, just let one of us know, okay? Um, we are going to be talking today about compassion. Um, I had Christy use this version, which it ended up being... Um, can't remember. We had to search. But um, this version of this scripture, Colossians 3.12, uses the word compassion. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those were the words that Paul wrote to the church of Colossae and to us. Um, as almost, it's not a command, but a command that this is the way you should be living. And compassion is listed among those. And so today we're going to be talking about words of compassion. Before we do that, though, I want you, those of you who have a piece of, you grabbed your paper and you have something to write on, you could jot these down on your paper. If not, just think them in your brain where you'd be able to share but I think compassion is a word we often use other words um, 
to replace it or in place of. So real quickly, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds, jot down some other words we use for the word compassion. So what are some other words you use for the word compassion? Jot them down or think them. <clears throat> Full teacher mode. What are other words we sometimes use in place of compassion? Maybe you hear them. The scriptures use another word often. Um, Ten more seconds. All right. Start. Start giving me some of those words. Empathy, okay? Pity. Intuitive hearing. What? Companionship. <laughs> Did I do it? Yeah. Okay. I'm a pretty good speller, but sometimes when you're writing on a board, it's okay. Any others? Benevolence. Benevolence. Love. Love. Grace, there's one that I'm wishing someone would say. I'm being that teacher who has one thing on my mind and I really want y'all to say it. What do we read in the scriptures? Okay. That's not it, but I like it. <laughs> Starts with an M. How about mercy? Mercy, mercy. Listen, I love your list, you know. Um, I just, when I started to study compassion um, and prepare for this, I realized we use a lot of other words. Um, my class this year, I, um, those of you who are teachers, you know we have like bell work time. When students walk in, you want them to be engaged doing something so they're not just sitting around talking and whatever. You want them to get going with their day. And um, I decided this year my theme was empathy. So I have been talking to my students every day I see them about empathy. And we've covered all kinds of things. But often when we're talking about empathy, we use the word compassion. And I realize, you know, they're, they're closely linked. Um, when we read scripture, most of the time, depending again what version you're reading, they use, the word mercy or kindness is used. Um, so although we could kind of um, use these other words, I do think when we look them up, we find different definitions for them. Um, but I think in the, as a whole, they're the same, right? When we say compassion, we are probably thinking of one of these things. The definition of compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. So we're seeing, we're noticing the sufferings or misfortunes of others, and we feel sorry for them, and we are concerned for them. Um, that, <clears throat> that is compassion. I had the honor to speak to you a couple weeks ago about words of love. I really think these two should almost be taught together, don't you? I mean, they almost like fit together. Now I have thought in my head of some examples where we have compassion on people and we're like, do we love them? But really, if you love people in the sense that God wants you to love people, then you're loving your neighbor. That's everybody, right? And so if I have compassion on them, I think the two are linked together. And where do we see that most? I think we see that in Jesus. To me, I think when I think it is in his compassion for people that I see his love. Right? And, and same could be true for God. 
God, Jesus, we're talking about the same thing, right? But God, I mean, it's mentioned throughout Scripture about the compassion that the Lord has for us. Um, I was shocked, though, I, and this will show you maybe my ignorance as a Bible student, how many times I've read so many stories and skipped over the part where it says Jesus felt sorry for him. I was like, really? This is a lot. Like, I could think of one. Um, but it's a lot. So I am going to put all of these up here. I, I didn't want to have, have the full scriptures up there. I'm going to kind of briefly tell you what each one is. Um, <clears throat> but these were all places where Jesus felt compassion for someone. And the scriptures tell us this. Um, so I thought that was, I don't know. I, I was shocked. Matthew 14, 14 and Mark 6, 34, they're there together because it's the same story told by two different apostles. Or, yeah. And um, it is the story when Jesus goes away, comes back, there's a huge crowd and they're hungry. And he ends up, it says, he felt compassion for them, uh, the great crowds that were waiting for him. He healed their sick and he fed them. And this would be the feeding of the 5,000. We know this story, right? So he had compassion on them. They were hungry. He felt bad for them. In Mark 1, 41, um, Jesus felt sorry for the man. He came to him and had a skin disease. And it says Jesus felt sorry for him, and so he healed him of his skin disease. In Matthew 20, 34, Jesus felt sorry for two blind men. They had been sitting. They had been begging asking people for help, um, as would probably be normal for blind people at the time um, if they didn't have family to care for them. And he healed them, and it says he felt sorry for them. In Mark 5.19, Jesus, after he removed the demons from the demon-possessed man, um, he says, go um, tell your family that the Lord had mercy on you. Um, again, we get the impression he felt. Sorry for him. Um, in Luke 7.13, that's the one I'm really going to focus on. So if you have your Bible and you want to go to Luke 17, or 7, sorry, I am going to read this whole scripture. This is possibly one of the most beautiful stories and pictures of compassion I think we have of Jesus. It's the story of the widow in Nain, um, the city of Nain, whose only son died, and he ends up healing her son or raising him from the dead. So real quickly, I'm going to read it. We're starting, uh, this is Luke 7, verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his followers and a large crowd traveled with him. When he came near the town gate, he saw a funeral. A mother who was a widow had lost her only son. A large crowd from the town was with the mother while her son was being carried out. When the Lord saw her, he felt very sorry for her and said, don't cry. He went up and touched the coffin and the people who were carrying it stopped. Jesus said, young man, I tell you, get up. <clears throat> and the son sat up and began to talk. Then Jesus gave him back to his mother. All the people were amazed and began praising God, saying, a great prophet has come to us. God has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread through all Judea into all the places around there. Tons of thoughts, tons of questions. I really think you could have a whole class on just this story. Here's some of my thoughts. How many people did Jesus see in his daily travels? And he picks this woman. Or was it that he was showing compassion to people all the time? This is just an amazing one that was recorded. His words of compassion to her are, don't cry. It's so simple, right? And I'll say more about that in a moment. But how nice it would be able to feel compassion for someone. Tell them don't cry and have confidence in knowing everything's going to be okay. That would be great, right? The people praise God after witnessing this event or after hearing about it. Maybe they weren't there. And their, their praise is God has come to help his people. They felt God's compassion through this event of their son. And the last one she didn't say one word to Jesus that we know of. It wasn't recorded that she even spoke, that she asked for help, anything, yet he knew her pain, he knew her sadness, and he helped her in that moment. 
So you could probably pull out other things that you see, you feel, you question, but in terms of compassion, feeling compassion for others, speaking words of compassion to others, here's what I got from the story that I want to share with you. Jesus saw her. He saw the funeral. Now, I got to believe it says soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. Did he go to Nain because he knew what he was going to do? I got to believe he probably did. Did he know from afar she was a widow? This was her only son? Probably so. But here's what it is for us. He saw her. So here's the thing. We have to see people. We have to be looking we have to be listening. We cannot be so caught up in our own selves and our schedule and where we got to go and what we got to do that we forget to see people like Jesus did because he saw her and he went to her. Number two, Jesus had followers and a large crowd with him. It says that there. Um, he stopped in that moment for this woman. For this moment, he stopped. And, and he did this for this woman. Again, we have to be willing to stop what we are doing. This one I'm really bad about. I got students walking in my door. I'm standing at the door, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And sometimes I can see it, right? I have to be willing, oh, you know, okay. Hey, come out here, talk to me for a minute. Like, that's my example. You have your own where you are every day, but we have to be willing to stop what we are doing and give the time and attention that people need um, to give words of compassion. Um, for me, the most sincere compassion I've ever received is when I know somebody's taken like a moment to write a card, when somebody has taken me aside to tell me something that would, you know, relieve whatever I'm going through or I know they have taken time out of their lives to do something great. Um, that's sincere compassion, is when you've taken that time to do it. Jesus met this woman in her darkest moment. We must be willing to get in the trenches with other people. Sometimes stuff is really ugly, um, but that's when people need us most. But the honest truth is, I, as I was preparing this, Honest truth is, most of the time we need to show compassion. It's not in somebody's like darkest moment. We really need to be doing it all the time. But when it's ugly, they might really need us there the most. Um, but not to say it's not something we should be doing all the time to everyone. And lastly, I think that maybe showing compassion is sometimes going to be easier for me anyway. Some of you are really good at words of compassion. But I don't know about you, it's the word thing that holds me back sometimes. <laughs> I, I can show you compassion, but having the right words in that moment. So as I, you know, I'm supposed to be telling you words of compassion today. I'm like, I don't know what the right words are. Jesus, man, he got that confidence of saying, don't cry, because he knew he was about to make everything better. We don't know that. We don't know, does anybody want to talk about it? What's the right words? How should I say it? When should I say it? You know, whatever. We, we struggle with that. So here's what I know. We have a big God who does amazing things. I've heard several of the ladies say, um, and I have learned through reading scripture and examples of so many of you about saying a prayer in that moment. We have to be more willing to talk to our big God who knows what the outcome is going to be. And see, we can stop in that moment and we can say, Lord, give me the right words. Tell me the right time to do this. Um, and maybe it's not going to feel perfectly comfortable, um, but I'm confident the right words are going to come. Um, then we can speak the right words of compassion at the right time. When we've consulted with the one who knows everything is going to be okay. He can say, don't cry because he knows everything's going to be okay. So if we consult him first, then I'm confident we'll have the right words um, to say. Okay, hold your comments, thoughts till later. <laughs> um, we have Miss Nancy Clyatt to speak with you today. Um, in answering the questions we gave her, she has been a Christian for 62 years. Um, she's been a member of Central for since 1965. So 
She's been here a long time. Uh, she's married. She has three children. Um, love her fun facts. She plays the violin. I did not know that. She loves to sing. Listen, if you have never sat in that back corner and listened to her and her sister sing, you've missed out on worship. <laughs> no, um, they are lovely. And I get the privilege of saying they sang at my wedding. So it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. Favorite um, hymn is Quiet My Mind, Dear Lord. And her hobbies are chickens. That made me even happier which I need to talk to you about later, but. <laughs> All right, Ms. Clyde. I had three chickens on my hand. Oh, that's always the way. That's always the way. All right. I think that'll work. Do I need to flip anything for you? Do no, you have any slides? Okay. I do not have any slides. Right. I'm not that techie. That's cool. Good morning, everybody. I want to piggyback on what Hillary said a little bit when she wanted to thank Christy and Sonny for organizing and choosing the theme, the right words at the right time. Speaking words that matter are huge, and as sisters in Christ, we need to pay attention to the words we choose to use and the effect they have on the people who hear them. So again, I want to thank you for your stewardship and putting the class together, but I have one tiny complaint, just one. Oh, oh. I don't know how you came up with the order, but did you have to put me after Hillary? She, she's a hard act to follow. Oh. It's not an actual microphone. Do I need to put it in a different place? It's not an actual microphone. Okay, it's just for the video. Front? It does nothing though for sounds. So okay. You might just have to see. Wow. It has nothing to do with the sound in here. It's for the purpose of video. Okay. Okay. I also want to tell my fellow sisters in Christ who have already given their testimony about the words that have changed their lives, and again, also Christy and Sunny, that I feel sure that you all make God smile. So my, since I am so far the oldest one that's been on this stand up here on this podium, I'd like to start by remembering the world I grew up in. If you were born between 1946 and 1966, you are a baby boomer. If you're a baby boomer, raise your hand. Woo, there's a lot of us in here. If you were born before 1946, before 19, raise your hand. Oh, okay. God has blessed you with time. If you were born after 1966, raise your hand. Oh. You have so much to look forward to. Because look, you're going to get wings. I'll start with a little history of us baby boomers. We were born to those Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. They had survived a terrible war that required sacrifices. No one was excluded. Whether you were in the trenches or on the home front, everyone was touched by the hardships of war. Our parents were a generation that believed that we were a country whose constitution granted us freedom of religion not freedom from religion. We were raised in a time when America believed in prayer and faith and family. And the words that came out of our mouths mattered to everyone. In my early years, teachers would say things like, even if I don't catch you doing something wrong, God saw what you did. <laughs> Imagine that today being said in a classroom. I was taught that the all-seeing eye was watching me no matter where I was or what I did, and especially what I said. Those were the right words at the right time in my life. I lived in a time when church bells rang out Sunday mornings to remind all with ears that it was time to worship the God who made them. Those were the right sounds at the right time. 
I lived in a time when innocence was mainstay, and the media, <coughs> excuse me, the media chose TV shows like, raise your hand if you watch these, Father Knows Best, Captain Kangaroo, Lassie, I Love Lucy, Leave it to Beaver. Those were shows with no bad words, no sex, and they all taught a moral lesson. Those were the times that I and my fellow baby boomers were raised in, a time when God was alive and well and living everywhere. It was an innocent time to be raised in with rules and procedures and prayers for a righteous life that would allow us a heavenly home. Unlike today, faith was an integral part of our culture. That is the kind of world we baby, born, boom, baby boomers were born in. Listen to the words of popular songs or watch some cable TV and you'll get an idea of where we are today when it comes to righteous behavior and faith and the use of words that matter. We baby boomers lived in a very different world. There is so much that has changed in my lifetime that I sometimes feel like I'm living in a foreign land. But do you know what hasn't changed? God's word. They are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Consider this. Of all of God's creation, humans are the only ones who were given the words for conversational speech. Language and words are a gift from God. Our very names are a gift. Because in Isaiah 49, 16, God says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. We are written on the palms of God's hand. Wow. Using the right words at the right time can heal a wound or lighten a heart. In contrast, the wrong words said have the potential to destroy someone with a fat, fragile faith or devour a child's worth. Once a word is spoken, you can't take it back. Like Christy said, you can't put it back in the tube. If you want to know who wins the war of words, think about it this way. There's an Indian grandfather talking to his grandson about the, word, the war of words. He tells his grandson that there are two wolves fighting. One wolf uses words like peace and love and kindness. And the other wolf uses words like war and hate and cruelty. The grandson asks, who wins, grandfather? And the grandfather replies, the one you feed. We need to feed the practice of using the right words. We need to choose them wisely. And they need to matter to the person we're saying them to. Words said with kindness and love can change a person's pathway towards righteous behavior. They can lift a person's spirit and help them see the love of God through our choices of words and behaviors. However, the wrong words at the wrong time can cut through a person's soul like a knife in butter. Christy talked about forgiveness and how important it is to our very existence. But sometimes words can cut so deep, it can take a lifetime to accomplish the kind of forgiveness that you can also forget. When Christy was trying to recruit me to speak on right words at the right time, she said, my talk could be on lyrics, scripture, sermon, or what somebody said. I mean, it was wide open. When I was trying to decide what I'd talk about, there were just too many events in my life to just pick one. Because faith generated from words or excuse me, episodes in our lives are not one-time events. We are all a culmination of our life experiences. They make us who we are. It is those situations and experiences that moves us to fill our faith in tangible ways. There wasn't just one moment in time that made me sense the pull of eternity. It wasn't one conversation or song or situation that made me think about heaven or hell. So I decided to take you through my life walk from my childhood to the present and how my first thoughts about eternity came in the wee hours of the morning in 1960. I had slept through the noise and footsteps of strangers in my home. I was awakened with the words, 
your daddy is dead. I wasn't eased into the situation. The emotion was fact with no frills. But they were the wrong words at the wrong time because I found no comfort in them. The days preceding that revelation are still vague. I remember very little except for the fact that in my child mind, I was still waiting for my father to walk through the door at any moment. I didn't really have closure. I didn't really understand death. Not surprising when you consider I was only nine years old. The death of my father was the closing of one door and yet the opening of another. Because even though I didn't really understand death, I knew that there is an end time that closes a door never to be opened again. I knew that my father would never again have the opportunity to be baptized into the body of Christ. His door was closed forever. I knew where his final resting place was as far as his body went, but his soul was in question. That one thought frightened me. I watched my mother crumble into her grief and isolate herself in the bedroom. I worried about how we were going to survive without my father, and yet I understood one thing for sure. Unless I believed and confessed my sin and was baptized, my fate would be sealed, just like my father. On May 10, 1960, only months after the death of my father, I was baptized by James T. Miller at the Seminole Heights Church of Christ in Tampa, Florida. I do remember the hugs and congratulations, but most of all, I remember the water dripping off my ponytail and running down my back. <laughs> you remember I was only nine. I had started my journey to forever. It is, a walk that, it is a walk that I journey on to this very day. I'm ever mindful of my mistakes, past and present, and my need to pray for forgiveness of omission and commission. Baptism is only the beginning of the walk of faith. The road is not always smoothly paved. We find potholes and crevasses that slow our path and make us stumble. It is through our faith, however, that we use the blessings of prayer and forgiveness to pave over our transgressions and to find more potholes ahead. That was the catalyst for my baptism in my youth. Move ahead 28 years. It's 1988 and I'm suffering, caught in a midlife crisis. I found myself immersed in what seemed like a very hollowed out time in my life. The circumstances are not important. What is important is how I was handling it and the effects it was having on me and my faith. When you're over, emotionally overwhelmed and your body decides you need a rest, it will just shut you down. My body decided that it would put me in a 12-hour coma every day. I went to bed at 7 o'clock at night, and I woke up at 7 o'clock the next morning, and I didn't even turn over. I didn't even dream. I lost so much weight that a good friend said I looked like death eating a cracker. I wasn't sure exactly what she meant by that, but I was sure it wasn't a compliment. Family and friends were supportive, but I needed something more. I needed something that Deanna Bonnell called God with the skin on. So I sought a Christian therapist and poured out my heart. She led me to the following statement. The only way to is to go through. It took me a while to really figure out what she meant that to me, what it was supposed to mean to me, but the bottom line was, if you want to find your way to get somewhere, you have to go through things to get there. They were the right words at the right time. I'd been taught in the Bible, study, and heard sermons about biblical figures who killed giants and wrestled with angels. I saw others weather the storms of life through things like death of a life partner or physical life or death challenges or serious financial issues things that were really far worse than my life challenge. I'd just been too numb and self-absorbed to bring the answer out from under the bushel where I'd hid it. I knew very well that if I was ever to make it to heaven, there were things I would have to do, things I would have to endure. And if I wanted to get to heaven, I had to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. I had to pattern my life with something that would heal the hurt. Forgiveness, forgiveness is not always easy to achieve. 
It depends sometimes on how deep the cut. Sometimes a band-aid will suffice. Sometimes, well, sometimes stitches are required. And sometimes the wound needs surgery where the festering lesion can be excised and packed with the healing salve of Christ's love, the person who will never leave or betray you. I've had more than one tragedy in my life. I always thought I was a kind and thoughtful follower of the Bible and Christ's word. I, I'm a good person. And I'd ask myself, why me? And then I had to remind myself of Matthew 5.45 that God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Being Christ-like doesn't mean that our lives are going to be a cakewalk. 1 Peter 5.8 says the devil is like a roaring lion that prowls around seeking someone to devour. The devil wanted to devour me. He was testing my faith. But I convinced him through my faith walk, that I wouldn't have tasted very good. <laughs> I had to remember that nothing except eternity lasts forever and that God would never give me more than I could endure. There is a song that says, what does it kill you makes you stronger? There's a deep truth to those words. They can be the right words if you say them at the right time. If you don't think that's right, see what happens the next time you leave the toast in the oven too long. I know because the joke in my family is that I've burned enough toast to feed another country. <laughs> we can have all the pity parties we want, but we just can't stay there. We have to pull ourselves out and start anew and plan a plan that's achievable. One step at a time, one day at a time, sometimes it's only one moment at a time. But we can only do that through our walk with Christ by our side. It will be our earthly family and fellowship with those in the body of Christ, that koinonia that we studied about, and our faith in the hereafter, so wonderful that words just can't do it justice that will help us through. Those are the things that will move us to calmer waters and hopefully one day onto Jordan's shores. Wounds leave scars. They are there to remind us to guard ourselves from lions and to change those things within our grasp and to forgive those things we cannot change. I've talked about things in my childhood, the death of my father and how it opened the door to baptism. I talked about my middle-aged darkness and how the only way to is to go through. And how those were the right words at the right time and how they gave me reasons to endure the stresses of life in ways that would allow my faith to shine through the power of forgiveness and the love of those who circled around me. Now I want to move to my late adulthood. It's 2009. It was 6 o'clock in the morning when the phone rang. It was the call that all parents dread to get. A stranger on the other end of the phone line is talking to my husband. He's, my husband says, what do you mean he's not breathing? Call 911. I stood in silence as an EMT person got on the line and said, I'm so sorry, sir, but your son has died peacefully in his sleep. Wrong words. Words no parent wants to hear. I'd just been joking with him 12 hours before telling him to, Wear your seatbelt, take your binders, love you. Josh was struggling with renal fail, failure, and he was on dialysis. I thought, am I being punished? Am I being tested again? Why me? Why my son? You're not supposed to outlive your children. Because when you lose a child, you lose the future. My life had already been changed with death and misery. How was I to confront this challenge when part of me had been ripped out? When people ask what they could do for me, I, I tell them, if you can't give me my son back, you can't do anything for me. There were no words of comfort that could heal the wound because you see, like my father, my son had not taken on the body of Christ through baptism either. His door was closed forever. 
And just like it was with my father and my mother's eye, I was picturing my boy just walking through the door at any time. I did find the comfort I needed, however. He came to, to me through Colin Williamson, who said, Nance, only God knows Josh's heart and what he would have been destined to do in the future. God's grace and mercy can cover all of us. The right words at the right time. And boy, do I miss that man. Move 13 years ahead from my late adulthood to today. It is 2023. I'm moving quickly toward the twilight time of my life. These days, time is very precious to me. James 4.14 says, What is your life? You are but a mist that appears for a little while and slowly vanishes away. Psalm says that our years are three score and ten. Since I'm three score ten plus two... <laughs> I'm living off of borrowed time. For all you young adults out there who are living in your prime of life, this next part is for you. I promise you that there will come a time in your life when you will wake up and look in the mirror and say, who are you? Age will creep, on you, uh, <coughs> age will creep up on you just that fast. You will open your mouth and your mother's words will spill out <laughs> like the phrase you swore you'd never say. And you can say this along with this, because I said so. There will come a time when you will dig up bones of all the things you wish you could take back, all those things you wish you had done, all those moments in time when you, you wish you could do over, and you will think about your eulogy and what people will remember you for, or wonder if they will remember you at all. All our days are numbered. Make the most of them. Make the most of them while you can, because we never know when the angel of death will come to retrieve us, and we will stand before the great Almighty and give an accounting of our lives, good and bad, and our walk of faith, and whether or not we spoke the right words at the right time. At this point in my life, I'm very conscious of the value of time. The thing I seek most is peace. Singing songs of praise at church and listening to Christian voices and the words of faith we sing touches me to the core and make tears sneak from my eyes and roll down my cheeks. And I feel such peace. I just wish I could remember to bring a tissue with me when I come. <laughs> They say that our eyes are the window to our souls. In a way, tears might be the way God cleanses them so that his love and grace can shine through. The words to the songs we sing remind me of the beauty of Christianity and that there was a Christ who died a terrible death so that we might one day have a home with him. They are the right words at the right time in the right place when we sing them in the house of God. I listen to the names of those saints who've gone before me and the urgency of the hour because my time is unknown, but it will come. In conclusion, I hope something I've said or shared with you is worthy of remembrance. I hope I have shared my past in such a way that you will use it to your advantage and that you can see how the right words at the right time can change a heart, mend a soul, clear a path. I hope you will find some comfort in knowing that God's help. with God's help you can endure and prosper from those things in life that seem so insurmountable. There are, however, no guarantees that tomorrow will ever come because every day is a gift from a God who writes our names on the palms of his hands. Thank you for listening. Okay, I, we are like right at time, but here are your three reflecting questions. So think about them. Definitely 
definitely words of wisdom there and things to consider and apply to our lives. Any comments, thoughts before we leave? If you have something that you need to write down, our takeaway board is like almost full. So write something. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much.